Um, welcome from the Warner Historical Society. I'm the executive director, Lynn Clark. And this is our second community conversation. This evening, the topic is Indigenous Peoples of Warner. Um, if you have questions as we're speaking, type them into the chat and we'll get to them after the presentation is done. Otherwise, please leave yourself muted until after our presentation and then you'll have plenty of time to talk. Um, and I'd like to introduce my co-conspirator this evening, <laughs> Sherry Gould. And Sherry, you want to tell the people about yourself? Sure, Kwai Ndelawazi Sali Gould, Ndai Manadnak, Nwikiak, Massasikam, Nodzia Basnoda Kaad. And I just said in Abenaki, hello, my name is Sherry Gould. I was born in Peterborough, Manadnak. I live really in Warner, but in a little section south of Lake Massasikam. <laughs> and, um, and I'm a professional basket maker. Uh, be, beyond that, I can tell you, I grew up in Hillsborough. My mom grew up in Bradford, graduated from Simons High School. Um, what else? I'm married to my husband, Bill. We've lived in Warner since 1982, however many years that is, pretty long time. <laughs> and uh, I was a professional social worker, sort of, administration in residential care, and then worked for the state and automated child welfare systems. <laughs> and a genealogist, and I'm a member of the Nalhegan Abenaki tribe. Great. So um, without any further ado, let's, we're, we're going to touch on um, many aspects of indigenous history in this area for the past at least 12,000 years, but let's begin at the beginning. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to say this, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Tony Adodzi Talwadak Kizitok Kidakina, which is when the owner creator made the world, he made the mountains, the trees, and the animal people. I love the uh, bird figure coming up from behind the mountains. And what it looks like is a copper, which I guess really was brass, whatever, artifact that was found in Manchester. Um, I guess there were two of them found. And some people call it the Abenaki Thunderbird, but I agree with David Stewart Smith that it's likely a swallow. It's got swallow legs or tail. <laughs> um, so, Abenaki people were the first people here. Here, as soon as the glaciers retreated, there were people here and their descendants today are known as the Abenaki. And this is some of the archeological finds right in this town. Uh, these two on the left and in the middle were found in Davisville. And the one on the right was found all the way across town um, and the Parsons home which I believe is in the Waterloo District. The Davisville artifacts are part of collections found by Cyrus Dustin and Nathaniel Davis on their farms when they were plowing their fields in the 19th century. They were donated to the Hoppington Historical Society in 1873, so long before there was a Warner Historical Society. So looking at these artifacts, we can tell that indigenous people lived in Davisville at least 6,000 years. The collections that they um, gave to the Historical Society include pieces of earthenware containers, which is down here. This is a rim of a pot um, that were used for storage or for cooking. Uh, fishing weights, and here you see somebody holding up this little fishing weight. Uh, stone points, which we don't have pictures of, and the points could have been for projectiles or for spears or darts, but also were used as knives, drills, any sort of cutting implement. Um, a very large pestle. Um, this is a woodworking tool, a gouge. And they also found some personal adornment items, numerous woodworking tools. And this artifact uh, of the Parsons is another kind of woodworking tool called a cell. Um, so. Lots of, lots of those. 
Um, but when you see these big stone objects, you have to, if you're wondering about what life was like over those thousands of years, you have to also picture all the things that are perishable, that didn't survive archeologically. So things made of um, tools, instruments, clothing, personal adornment that were made from wood, bark, bone, sinew, skins, all that shell. And maybe even more importantly, you have to remember the stories, the ideas, the beliefs, the dances, the songs, all of that, many of which survive as oral traditions among Abenaki people today. And by the way, we know that there are many artifacts that have from the area that haven't been donated to museums or, to, or, or have been recorded in the state. No doubt many sites were disturbed when they made the railroad along the river or when I-89 came through. So we'd love to hear about the locations you know about um, and see the artifacts so that we can add it to our picture of Warner's past. We're also looking for some help to solve this little mystery. In 1890, a visitor to town found what he called picture graph writing on Mount Kearsarge. I presume he was talking about carvings in stone, what I would call a petroglyph. Um, this man, C.H. Bennett, who came here from, uh, visited from Pipestone City, Minnesota, was married to Addie George. And Addie was one of the famous George sisters in town. She wrote a poem um, based on Longfellow talking about Pipestone and was very romantic, you know, had all these romantic notions about the Indians and the Pipestone and wanted to visit. So her father took her out there where she met Mr. Bennett and they married. Uh, and their uh, wedding invitations were made out of this red pipestone. And you can see some of that pipestone at the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum. Jerry, did you want to say anything about Mount Kearsarge or um, the pipestone? Not so much about that. I, I was going to comment on something you said in the last slide. Uh, oh, well, a couple of things. One thing is, I was I read something recently regarding the glaciers and some anyway that it there's some, there is some evidence or some theories that our people were and so this does apply to Kearsarge living up in the mountains during part of the ice age that that helps explain some of the time difference between the length of time we're finding the artifacts and um and the receding of the glaciers. So I thought that was really interesting. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. Anyone who does have artifacts, I think a lot of people get nervous that they're gonna wanna be taken away or they're gonna be in trouble for having them. And I just wanted to assure everybody that that's not the case. Like, you know, we certainly hope nobody's pillaging graves, but finding something on the ground and picking it up and having it in your collection is not no trouble, no problems. We would love to see them because like Lynn said, it adds to the history and it adds right. to the picture of what we know. And I think that um, we don't know as much of that for Warner because the big project was I-89 and the federal laws that said, if you're doing a big project using federal money, you know, you have to test for cultural resources. That was after that project. And there really hasn't been a lot of federal money being spent around Warner on those kinds of projects recently. The other thing I would say quickly is there's a myth that uh, the Indians were um, afraid to go up the mountains because of spirits that lived up there. And, and that really is a myth. It, it was not the case at all. To, um, I do believe that it was a lot, it took a lot of energy to climb. It takes a lot of energy to climb a mountain. And today we can take that for granted, but when you had to gather all your calories <laughs> to consume, you probably, and you know, you were busy like making everything to live. Um, you probably didn't recreate on top of mountains, but certainly when there was a reason to go up the mountain, our people did that always, and they weren't afraid of the mountains. There's nothing in oral history, nothing in our language nothing that indicates um, fear of the mountains. Well, 
and uh, Go ahead. you want to talk about um, what you what you learned about enslaved Native people. Yes, uh, this was a really interesting thing for me. Years ago, Lynn had contacted me uh, with some information about um, Sabatis, who had married. Um, who had married a, a Native American wife. And, and so anyway, I, I looked into it. I was reading up on it. And I discovered that he had married a woman who had been enslaved in the a Caribbean slave who was working for a family in New Hampshire. And Lynn probably knows more of the details than I do on it. But as soon as I saw a Caribbean slave, I was like, oh, that's not local. That's, I, I blew it off. A few years later, I was sitting at a lecture at UNH and a scholar that I meant to look up, I apologize, I don't have her name, but this wonderful woman who had done some very scholarly research was reporting that um, she had discovered that uh, she had gone down to the Caribbean because a lot of the Abenaki people and Massachusetts people that were taken uh, when Waldron's, and that's what this picture depicts, when um, at a raid they did at, at Waldron's trade house, were sold into slavery in the Caribbean. And the descendants there, even today, know that they were Abenaki and Massachusetts. They know that they came from New England. And there's even some records she had done some research and was still actively researching, but starting to write about her research. So I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, so this woman was likely somebody who had come back from there that was originally from here or could well have been. And it just opened a whole new window into our past for me. Right. So some of those details are, and that's the Warner connection to African Native Americans. Um, there was a woman named Lucy Clark who lived in Sutton and Warner, and you've probably heard Rebecca course or speak about Lucy who was married to the fiddler Anthony Clark. Well, so Lucy's parents were Samson Battis and Lucy Carey. And Lucy was the a woman who had been enslaved um, in the West Indies and brought back, um, was working uh, in the Coffin household in Concord. Um, and Samson, it's thought by some that he is also African native because of the name Sabatis, which is also Sabatis. And um, their descendants are often referred to as the Battis tribe. And I know that some of them have had their um, DNA testing done and they are indeed African Native Amer American. So that's a part of the history that we don't often hear about in New Hampshire. But, and there was, you know, um, Native people didn't have the same prejudices against African American people that um, white people did. So there was more mixing. Then we come to the settling <laughs> when the colonial settlers first came to Warner. Um, they were trying to settle the town during the French and Indian War. So it was very hard to get people to come out here because they of course were afraid of being captured by the Indians. <laughs> um, and this is, a, is a, some artwork done by Fernanda Harrington for her book, Las Davisville, where she's showing um, that this, the first sawmill that was built, I believe in the 1740s, um, first sawmill and the first four houses that they built to entice people to come settle here uh, were burnt down during one of the, the Indians were coming through uh, um, from, from a raid somewhere and going on their way back up to Canada. So they just burnt down this, uh, this little settlement that was trying to get built. So of course, in the 19th century history books, it's referred to as one of the depredations of the Indians. But if you look at it another way, it was like Abenaki people just saying, stop encroaching on our territory. Um, but, you know, we, we normally hear about that history. That's what was written by the men who wrote the 19th century histories. It was all about focusing on con conflict 
But we have plenty of evidence if you look elsewhere for peaceful relations when there wasn't a war going on. Um, and these are some objects locally. This is a basket um, from Hoppington and basket expert that we had come down during one of our uh, baskets out of the attic days. Uh, thought it was the oldest Pennacook basket she had ever seen. Um, you hear about people going off to fight in the 18th century on snowshoes. Well, they not only sometimes learned to make the snowshoes from native people, but sometimes paid the native people to make their snowshoes for them. Um, and you had moccasin makers in Warner in uh, Hoppington. And this is um, from, again, this one is from Hoppington um, where there's um, John Courier was making a pair of moccasins. There are two pairs of moccasins in town. So obviously they learned that skill from the native people that were living around them. And there are also, if you look in um, other types of publications, some usually put together by women collecting oral traditions of settlers, you'll, you'll see plenty of stories about um, trade that was happening or people may have been afraid or apprehensive, but they still, you know, native people would come and, and stay overnight in someone's kitchen, but they'd always leave um, some something that they had hunted. They'd always leave a gift in return. So there's plenty of evidence that when there wasn't a war happening, there was a lot of interaction. And some of those stories survive of people right through the 19th, early 20th century interacting with native people right in this area after they supposedly disappeared. But Cheryl will tell you how they, they, they really were not disappeared. <laughs> so hiding in plain sight is a term we use for uh, Abenaki people who, who stayed in place and, um, and many did. And there were many different adaptive strategies. So um, the, I have a couple of things to share and uh, one of them isn't really hiding in plain sight, but it's, it refers to uh, back to the friendly relations. And I'm gonna talk a little more about Abenaki trails in a few minutes, but um, one of the things we've learned is that, so Hanneker had the same situation with the sawmill. They had set up a sawmill and clearly the Abenaki knew what the sawmill meant. It meant sawing out lumber to build houses. <laughs> and the sawmill was always the first thing that was uh, purposefully burnt down. But the first settlers, first attempt at settling Hanneker was putting up a sawmill. And, um, and so the fellows who were doing it had, one of them had gone some, to London Dairy and on his way back, he spied an Indian and shot him. And as soon as he did, knew big trouble. So they all left. Then it was 25 years. So about the same time period. So about 1765, when Hanneker was being settled, there was never any depredations, depredations in Hanneker. Uh, and in the history of Hanneker, they report that the, the settlers gave them shelter and provisions when the warriors would come down to raid the southern towns. So we had the Henniker settlers aiding and abetting the warriors in their war on the settlers to stop the encroachment on their lands. So that's a really interesting uh, peaceful relations <laughs> or peaceful relations in wartime. And by the neighbors might've been viewed as uh, disloyal <laughs> to the country, but we sure didn't feel that way. As time went on, Indian people, in order to adapt locally, uh, did many things. So the picture you see here is the Sadequist family, right? Sadequist, am I saying that right? Yes. Yep. Uh, who settled in Keene and, um, or some of them moved down to Keene. And so what you're seeing is on the left-hand side of the screen is some traditional Abenaki dress. Uh, and then on the right, you're seeing uh, the Sadequis family dressed in modern clothing. And so that was certainly one thing. And one of the things 
when you read in the history book, the last of the Indians died or was buried here or whatever, one thing, one theory about that is it was the last Indian wearing traditional clothing because at his funeral was his wife and children, but they were in white people's clothing. So clothing was definitely a sign of whether people were acculturated or continuing to practice uh, their traditions, which were, was viewed poorly. So by dressing in regular clothing and, and doing activities over time, native parents didn't really want to teach their children. So like my great grandfather was a basket maker, but he didn't, my grandmother and my mother didn't learn basket making. Louis Watso, who came down around 1900 to Newbury with his children to prevent them from being taken and put in the um, Indian schools, the, the oldest daughter had been taken. And then she came home and said, please don't ever make me go back. And they moved to New Hampshire. And Louis didn't teach his kids to speak the language or make baskets, though he and his wife were basket makers. And um, so that's, that was one way to stop doing the traditional things, to start wearing normal clothing. Um, in, in a lot of the old history books, there's a, a, a fellow, Ben Weiser, who was a Nipmunk Indian or a Massachusetts Indian. He was in the praying town of Natick as a child. And then he appears with this name, Benjamin Weiser. Nobody's really sure where the Weiser name came from. He moved to Canaan, New Hampshire, and he's in the history of Canaan as, um, what is it, a creative woodsy fellow. And, and so they were frequently hunting guides, fishermen, uh, they usually lived on the outskirts of town. And so everybody knew them and liked them. Nobody said they were Indian. They just said they were um, simple folks, backward folks, pleasant, pleasant person <laughs> is frequently a term, a pleasant person, huh? Unlike what, the people in town that are grumpy? <laughs> so there were many, many, many tactics and uh, the tactics changed, I think, through the years. Lynn's going to show one that my family adopted that I can talk about. But I don't, is, did you have more to say about that, Lynn? Am I forgetting? Um, any? You know, the, the, the only other thing I was going to mention is that, um, you know, the, the Sataquis, they actually weren't hiding <laughs> so much. As they, they, were, they were pretty openly Native because they did Native crafts. Um, as well as, you know, one of the daughters is one, one of the very first Native uh, Indigenous nurses in the country. Um, some of the sisters had a millinery shop, but also, the, you know, the father was um, making and selling crafts. But uh, one of the descendants, Lynn Murphy, had told, you know, I, I was hearing stories when I was up at the Indian Museum that people saying, oh, yeah, my grandmother lived near Keene and she was Abenaki. And after hearing a number of that, I, I told, I said that to Lynn Murphy and she said, oh yeah, you know, I said there was this whole community of native people living around the very open Sataquis family, but a whole community that was living very quietly that he, they were more hiding in plain sight. And she said, yeah, that her grandfather would bring people down, you know, so they could find work around Keene. And I think it matters at what point in time too, because earlier, you know, the, the Sataquises we're talking around the 1900 time period, right? And moving forward. And they had come from a, a reserve where they were secure and um, always all through time, I would say native people would go to Odenak, but then also leave Odenak for various reasons. It was the confines of the reserve or the rules or the restrictions or things like their children being taken away to boarding schools. So um, I'm not saying that's why the Sataquises came down. I'm not, I think, who knows? But um, anyway, that did happen. But earlier in earlier times, let's say from the 1750s through the 1850s is when it was more like in my impression and the stories I've read, your neighbors would know and friendly people would know, but it just wasn't talked. It was safer for you if it wasn't spoken of. Right. And 
And for some families, they didn't know, you know, for some families, it was, um, I think, high um, in Keen, Lost Boundaries, that book, I love that book, um, talking about the black family that lived there and passed for white, the doctor and his children. There was a movie made of it that goes by a different title, I think, but mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, same kind of phenomena, you know, it, whether you're passing for white as a black family or whether you're blending into the culture as a native family, you do what you have to do to get by because it wasn't, there were those parties that it was not okay to be the other with. And then there were those local people that it was, didn't care. We were helping each other. We were getting back to the the friendly relations so right yeah it was tricky <laughs> and and there were times when if you were african native some it was safer at times to pass for african american than it was to pass for native american as well and one other thing i wanted to bring up is that you pro folks have probably noticed that we're not talking just about warner and we're not even talking just about the United States or, or New Hampshire because those boundaries didn't exist. Right. <laughs> They're meaningless when you're talking about indigenous North America. Yep. So Abenaki people are still traveling in their traditional homeland. It, it just happens to cut across state and international boundaries. There is a lot of travel, but there's also a lot of settlement uh, and we'll, I'll talk more about that when we get to Abenaki Trails. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, a myth that we're constantly fighting against in New Hampshire is that the native people all went up to Canada in the early 1700s. And um, it's just not true. <laughs> so here is some physical evidence from our neighbors in Hoppington, this basket, it looks like a berry basket perhaps. Um, on the left, made in 1840, right in Hoppington. And um, this is probably fairly contemporary. Nancy Jo might pipe up with that later on, but you know, made by the native woman who camped by the river. So people who were returning to areas that had always been uh, places where Abenaki people lived right through the 19th century. And in, we'll find out in right through the 20th century. <laughs> And here's another example of Native people coming through the area in the 19th century. So maybe Sherry wants to talk about. I was so thing. excited when Lynn shared this with me because in my own family history, uh, my great grandfather, Eber Dyer, settled in Peterborough. So talking about moving and settling. So Eba settled in Peterborough in the, um, later 1800s and prior to that he his his parents lived as gypsies we have documentation both um, a letter from a great aunt and also Fred Tuttle from Vermont there's a movie made about him and some of you may have heard of him but Fred Tuttle um, the infamous Fred Tuttle, his family had a farm and my ancestors, my great great grandparents would go to his farm and they'd go out in the woods and get their brown ash to make their baskets. And so they all knew them as gypsies, that was safe. And the Phillips family was another. So for Abenaki people, the word tribe means family. So it's a family band is what tribe means and different tribes are different sizes. So in our family band, there was Blake's, Dyer's and Phillips, which were all anglicized names that, that people took on, but um, they all lived like gypsies and they would make their baskets and they would travel around New England selling their baskets with horse and wagon. So when I saw this, this is one of like three different families that this could possibly be. And one of them is ours. <laughs> <laughs> right here in Warner. And it gives quite a bit of detail too, that it, where they stayed. Have we looked up yet where John Tewksbury's was in the lower village? Um, I, I haven't um, pinpointed it, but Rebecca may know exactly where that is. 
she may not want to pipe in right now. So then that brings us to eugenics and the residential schools. And I've mentioned the residential school in terms of the, um, the Watso family moving down. So um, as we hit the 1900s, the eugenics program became very popular. And it was studying, uh, it was the belief that uh, people's genes impacted their behavior. Their, so, uh, and there was a whole school of thought that uh, I'm thankful that I am not, I can't speak extremely articulately about this, but uh, I've read the book, I know about it, I just really don't like it. Um, and so what happened was in Vermont, it was really pretty, pretty incredible. I actually was working for the state of New Hampshire for DCYF on the um, child welfare information system. And my boss had just come to me and asked me, because I'm a genealogist, he said, you know about like how relationships are handled in a software application. And so we want you to really think about that so that you can help the developers because the children that are in foster care or um, placement that we track in our system, you know, the relationships are, are so changing and we need to figure out how to have our, our program track that better. And I was like, oh, sure, no problem. And um, took a few days off, went to Vermont to the Sheep and Wolf Festival and Nancy Gallagher was there with this book, Breeding Better Vermonters. And I bought it and I read it that weekend and went back to work and I said, I am not telling you anything about how to track families or do any of it because it was just amazing to me there was no boundaries between law enforcement, mental health, doctors, um, social workers, none of it, town aid. There was, there was an incredible sharing of information across all of those venues. And so anyone who had any kind of health issues had gotten town aid, who, um, who was imprisoned, who you know, any kind of mental issues, anything that would be considered um, lesser people were referred to the eugenics program. And they, they actually hired a social worker to come in and a genealogist and work with the families to befriend them, to um, sit down and sweet talk them and and make them think they were there to help them. And they recorded all the genealogies of the families. And as people went into the hospital for routine procedures, they were sterilized and they came out unable to bear children. And this went on right up through like 1950s and later. And so the records were found, were located. The University of Vermont was um, where the fellow do you remember? Do you remember his name? Perkins. Right. Perkins was the head of it um, at UVM, and all those records were in the basement. And when they were discovered, Nancy took a year off. She was a teacher and took a sabbatical, used sabbatical to research it and write the book. And Abenaki families were targeted. French Canadian families were targeted. Other minority families. Um, so uh, the Dyers and the Blakes are traced. I haven't looked at them. It's nothing I wanted to go see. I'm a genealogist. I found my records elsewhere, but, but it was pretty chilling. So there's a family that moves um, from Vermont to Warner right around this time, around 1928, early uh, 1930s, that, um, you know, the, the descendants that we talked to don't necessarily say we came because of eugenics. Um, but we suspect that maybe that's why they were leaving the state because Vermont, it was pretty much Vermont was targeting native. Yeah. yeah, they were. It was happening in New Hampshire as well. And I was shocked when somebody told me that and I, I was in a little bit of disbelief. And then when I was doing a professional job, I was looking at uh, probate records up in Laconia and I found this 
record for a marriage, the judge gave permission for a marriage of the young woman I was researching. And um, I can't remember now the exact code, but when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that looks like eugenics. And then I go, oh, that's just me and my <laughs> native focus, like thinking I'm seeing something. But I called the law um, library at at Franklin Pierce and sure enough, she when she checked with the judge, it was a eugenics case. And that young woman who had been at the Laconia State School ha uh, had to be sterilized through eugenics in order for her to be allowed to marry at 16, some 45 year old man. It was pretty gross, but anyway, it did happen in New Hampshire, but it wasn't, I still don't believe it was to the extent it, it happened in Vermont. And certainly not targeting Maybe right, like and it you know it, it people don't know about this. You know, we we uh, Nancy Joe and I were doing a talk years ago at the the DAR and brought this up, and people were just horrified that they had never been taught about this. They had never heard about it. So here is a photo of Clement Mitchell as a young man, and a grandson wanted to be with us tonight. But um, his back is out. So that's Chris Mock. And uh, he's very proud of his ancestry. And he provided us with this picture. And, um, and then, yeah, go ahead and, and shoot forward to can the next you, one. Can you see the bottom one or do I have to move the oh, pictures? You can see I it? I see fine, yep. Okay, all right. So years ago, many, many years ago, Chris had shared with me his family story and asked me to do some research, which I, gladly did. And it was really interesting. So Clement Mitchell is the son of Delia Garin, or Garan, or Garin, I think they pronounced it. And you'll see here in the 1880 census in Brandon, Vermont, there they all are. And the first, the second, wait a minute, first column is color, and they're all white, W. And Delia is the daughter of Mitchell Garin and his wife, Olive. Well, and her brother Mulatto. Eugene. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Is Eugene's mulatto there? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. In 1870, Eugene's mulatto. Then, if you look at 1900 census, right below it, uh, by then, Delia has left um, her husband Clement, and which was Clement O's father. That we saw in the pre previous picture. She's left him and she's living with her son with her brother, Eugene, and their mother, Olive, lives there. So here we see that Eugene is black and Olive is white and Delia and Clement are both black. And then in the 1920 Middletown Springs census, here's Clement, the fellow in the picture and the boy who was black previously and he is white, and so is his wife Gertrude and his son Clement. Uh, Eugene, the brother, Eugene Garing, Clement O's uncle, when you follow him through the records, he consistently appeared as white. And in fact, in the 1930 census, he was white, but when he died in 1932, he was listed as mixed race. So it just goes to show that, because um, people will say, oh, look, it's a white person. So and so is claiming to be Indian, but look at this record. It clearly says they're white. The records are not reliable for things, and um, and that Indian people were frequently, if they were dark skinned, they were apt to be recorded as black. Or so it could be a black person. It could also be an Indian person. It's uh, it's very hard to. Um, to make any proven statements based on race notations in the records. <laughs> and um, Clement B. Mitchell, so Clement O's son, Clement, mm -hmm. um, he had a vacation home, a summer home on Joe Sylvia Lake in Hopkinton, which is where they found the dugout canoe. And he lived in a section of Hopkinton near the Henniker border that is just full of Abenaki history. So. I adore this story about him. He sort of like embodies all of the history of Abenaki history. So it's pretty neat. It is. And we're very thankful that the family let us share this story with you. 
Yeah, Chris is really, he just loved, he knew his great grandfather. He was very little. He was about six years old when Clement O passed on, but he remembers him very, very clearly. And, and then the stories about him, even as he got older, all the stories about his life and, yep. So this is my mom, Isabel Ingalls, who I think is watching, I Isabel Ingalls Blanchard. And mom grew up in Bradford and uh, her mom had been living in Peterborough, like I said earlier, where her father had settled. And um, when Mabel Dyer married Carl Ingalls, she moved to Bradford with him. So that's where mom grew up and she graduated from Simons High School when Simons was a high school. And this is her in uh, a few years ago, they had their, their class, their, their um, class reunion. And you can see in this picture, Dean Smith and uh, Ted Young and Liz Young hadn't come up yet. Uh, she chose not to come up the mountain with us when we drove up to the parking lot, but, and there's mom and her best friend, Mickey, beside her. And I am so sorry, I don't know the rest of these individuals. And unless mom chooses to, to pipe up and share with us, <laughs> maybe some people here recognize them. But um, mom was always known to be Native American by her classmates. It was no secret. And in fact, in her senior year, uh, she was voted the most likely to go to Hollywood and strum Indian maiden songs. <laughs> when she told me that, I said, what were you singing, mom? Because I knew she played guitar and she yodeled. And so I, I said, well, what were you singing? She goes, Patsy Klein." <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, it wasn't what you were singing. It was just people knew, knew you and your family and who you were. So for our family, it was never something that people felt like they had to hide and, uh, and that people felt like they were... Um, persecuted for. So we also wanted to talk about um, other indigenous people that um, live in Warner. Um, this man's name is uh, Peter Joseph Newell. And this photograph was, uh, this copy of this photograph was given to us by Carol Brown Howard, who um, Carol knew Pete and um, her, her dad worked with him and everybody apparently called him old the Indian. So he was Mi'kmaq from Mill Village in Nova Scotia. And he lived in Bradford in the 40s up probably till 1950 with Frank Fortune, who, who he worked for. And in one of the censuses, he appears as Pete St. Laurent, which is also a name that you would associate with Abenaki people. <laughs> but um, most of the time he's, he, he's correctly listed as uh, Peter Newell. Um, he did farm laboring and lumbering, obviously. This photo dates to 1951 when he was uh, living in Warner and employed by Orlin Fortune. Um, and he was working with Carol's dad at this point. And, and some of you might see this, uh, know this gentleman was Eli Palmer. He also worked with the Nunn family. Um, Highland Nunn and his sons as, as well. They all did the wood chopping. Um, uh, Peter Newell lived to be 83. Um, he died in 1963 when he was living at the county home in Boscoin. And Carol has not been able to find his grave yet, but if it's marked, she will find it. Um, and she also knew there were, there, of course, other people. Um, some of you may have known a gentleman named Guy Schoolcraft. Um, Carol said she called him Uncle Guy. Uh, some of you probably knew Paul Fouillard, who's been around town. Um, so there were a number of reasons why non-Abenaki people were living in Warner, coming for work. Uh, the government was resettling for a period, trying to resettle other groups from out west in um, mostly urban centers, but you know, some people may have been settled in New Hampshire and that purpose, they were doing that so that they would assimilate and not be Indian anymore. So the descendants of those people are in New Hampshire and maybe even in Warner. Um, some people 
who live in town know that they're native, don't necessarily, you know, grandma told them they were native, but then clammed up and didn't tell them anymore because remember, it wasn't always that safe. So they don't always have that connection to what tribal group they were, were with. And this is, like I said, by no means an exhaustive list. It's just an example of why um, non-Abenaki people would be living in a town like Warner. Remember to unmute. Ah, yes, here we are. So Bill and I, like I said, we're basket makers. And um, yeah, we are, we're very, very fortunate. I wanted to learn the craft that my, my great grandfather was one of the early basket weavers at the Peterborough Basket Company. And um, like I say, he did not teach. My grandmother was not a basket maker and my mom wasn't, but I really wanted to learn. So I was fortunate that Jeannie Brink was willing to take me as an apprentice. And I spent one year learning from Jeannie. And then um, the second year, uh, Liz Shalaboy, who we'll hear about next, <laughs> Liz wanted to do her second year of apprenticeship with Jeannie. So I said, okay. Um, and I found out about Newt Washburn. So Bill and I were able to apprentice for a year with Newt. And he, Newt was 92 when he took us on as apprentices. And um, Bill came to pound the ash and he was going to, um, he was going to pound some ash for, for Newt. And that was the deal. Well, he learned to do a lot more than pound ash and he learned to carve all the handles and we learned the difference between the fancy baskets. So the basket in the upper uh, left is a fancy basket. Down below that, you see the laundry basket would be a utilitarian basket. There's two napkin baskets inside. Um, one of them is a little fancy. The, yeah, the one you're on right now. But the center vase would be a fancy basket. So we learned the difference between, and Bill's fishing creel in the middle at the uh, top is a utilitarian style. So we learned the difference between those. And on utilitarian baskets, there's just a lot of carving, a lot of heavy work. And Bill learned to do all of that. And then finally, and I realized that initially I was really excited. I thought, well, these fancy baskets are really beautiful, but this is really what um, was done at Odenac. And, and it wasn't what my ancestors did. They did more utilitarian style baskets. So I was really excited to learn it, but pretty soon I was like, okay, this is really hard. Like, I really like making fancy baskets. <laughs> and in the meantime, Bill said, okay, I'm doing everything except weaving the basket. I might as well weave the basket. So he became the utilitarian basket maker and I became the fancy basket maker. And we eventually both were juried by the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. We haven't kept our jury up. Um, so we're not currently listed, but we did attain jury status. We were the first Native American or Abenaki people juried by the League. And, um, it's been fun. Talking about food sovereignty, I'm going to leave that one until we get to Abenaki Trails. Okay. So here's Liz Charlebois. Um, a lot of you probably know her. She lived in town until just, just very recently. Um, and she was the uh, education director for time at the Indian Museum. But I met Liz before that, before either of us were working there. She was uh, demonstrating basket making. So she like Sherry is a talented basket maker. Um, she also does bead work and um, recently kind of helped revive this craft of bitten work. So when you see her here biting into folded up birch bark. So she's not even looking at it. And then you open it up and you have these amazing designs. I can't even wrap my head around how this is done. <laughs> But traditionally, something like this would have been used as a, a pattern for beadwork. Mm -hmm. But now it's just an art form all in and of itself. Um, while Liz was at the, uh, the Kearsarge Indian Museum, she also started a uh, seed saving and um, was very adamant that we not just grow food at the, at the Indian Museum, but that we harvest it and cook it as well. So we had lots of nice dinners. And um, that work with food sovereignty is something that she's still doing out in the greater community. It's something uh, very near and dear to her heart. And she couldn't be here um, because she's like 
very busy. <laughs> she's she's a nurse and I uh, was working overtime for weeks though. So. But I, I think a lot of you know Liz. And um, you know, she tells a story about her daughter growing up here and facing a little pushback about being Indian. So when when her daughter was in fifth grade at a time when uh, the kids, a lot of the kids are they're talking about you know, where's your family from? What's your family tree? And the teacher was asking her daughter that question. And so her daughter said, we're from here. And the teacher just would not accept that as an answer. And, you know, so imagine a kid in fifth grade trying to argue with a teacher about, you know, we're from here, I'm indigenous, and the teacher just not getting it. Yeah. So that's what some native kids face. You know, you all disappeared. <laughs> and you're not here. <laughs> but um, the other amazing thing that's happened in Warner is that this little town boasts this uh, Indian museum that people come from across the country on tours of Indian museums and say this is like the best one they've seen. So we'll let the dr current director, uh, Andy Bullock, talk a little bit about the Indian Museum. Very good. Well, thanks for having me. I want everyone to know that certainly the museum is indebted to lots of folks over its 30 year history. Um, folks like Sherry and Lynn and Nancy Joe and Liz, and I'm sure more of you who I can't see all of your pictures tonight, but have a huge part in having the museum be so successful after 30 years. Uh, just a, by way of a brief backstory, I've been friends with Bud and Nancy Thompson for 45 years and first met Bud at powwows when he would bring some of the Shaker sisters to visit powwows. And Bud and I struck up a friendship and certainly that led to you know visits to Shaker Village where we would go and talk about artifacts and things like that and invariably go over and visit the Shaker sisters and. Luckily, we'd have pie almost every time. Every time you went anywhere with Bud, there was always some kind of snack involved. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, we're really excited on April 12th, Bud is gonna be celebrating his 99th birthday. So, um, so and I'll back up a little bit. So I was visiting with Bud one time at Canterbury Shaker Village. I'd come up from Massachusetts and he said, Oh, come on, I jump in the car. We're going to go for a ride. And this was in Canterbury, of course. And so we drove and drove and drove. And oh my gosh, I'd never been out Route 89 and going by Exit 5 and, and the beautiful vistas and all that sort of thing. And then pulled off into this little tiny town and up a winding road and pulled into the driveway of what was then the um, equestrian ring and this was when Bud was just looking at the property. He had actually come to Warner. I think the realtor was actually um, intending to show him the property that's now the uh, flea market on Kearsage Mountain Road and, and that didn't meet his requirements but going on a little bit further uh, he saw the the farmhouse that had been for sale and so when Bud and I were in the barn and, and he loves to tell the story of walking in there and you know wood chips on the floor and the pigeons and the rafters and uh, one of his good buddies Doug Hamill a kind of prominent shaker dealer was walking in there with him one time and of course the pigeons were pooping on Doug's head and, and Bud just thought that was hilarious. Uh, but it was that time that I realized that they had just such a phenomenal vision. Um, Bud had uh, history of being a troubadour uh, traveling around in his younger days and I'm sure a lot of you know that story but in his quest for unrecorded folk songs that led him to utopian communities like Canterbury Shaker Village and as buds want to do he knocked on the door of Canterbury Shaker Village and 30 years later left he you know he just founded such a bond with the Shaker community um, and then he helped the, the Shakers when they were, um, they had already put that property up for sale. And it was Bud who convinced them to go to Sturbridge Village 
and see what they could turn their property into. So it was Bud who really helped Canterbury Shaker Village move into a nonprofit uh, living community or museum. And then at 70 years old, what does he do but start yet another museum, Mount Kearsage Indian Museum, which includes about 12 acres of land. And when he moved into that property, it was basically a horse farm. And over the years had continues, I talked to him today, uh, continues to think of ways to kind of improve that property, whether it's uh, building up the five acre arboretum we have where we've got about 85 different species of trees and all that sort of thing. But I think the underlying thing about Bud and Nancy was their vision not to have the biggest collection with the most baskets, not to, not to tell people what to think about native people, but more to start those conversations and, and kind of be a, a hub of community that we could engage native folks because um, I was a trustee for, at the museum for the first, I don't know, 15 years or so of, of its existence. And then came back uh, about three years ago to be the director. And what I, I still can't get it out of my head, in that first couple of weeks I was there, there was a, an adult couple that came to the museum, absolutely, you know, enthralled, but they assume, they told me that there were no native people living in New England for 200 years. They had all been eradicated and, and just couldn't imagine that there are, were continuing to be native folks. The other thing, the, the kind of exciting part about the way Bud and Nancy designed this museum, and um, I think most of you have been there over the years, it's a circular um, gallery that takes people all the way across North America so that they can go into the Northwest Gallery and see how, um, what foods people were eating and what the dress was and how people were transported and then go into the Southeast and the Southwest. And, and that evolution really helps visitors, I think, to understand the huge diversity of native people. And the other thing developed again by um, Lynn and Nancy Joe and, and folks over the years, Liz, in each of the galleries, we've got a, a examples of contemporary native art. So we can show baskets, you know, 200 year old baskets right next to absolutely traditional basketry that's been made within the last 10 years, 15 years. So we can really hit home the fact that people are still here working in harmony and you know, when you put those things together, people start to kind of piece it together in their heads. So I'm really excited that we can incorporate the environment that we have, the medicine woods and the, and the arboretum, and show how that all um, works together with the collection that we have. And, and our goal, uh, a lot of the folks, I think Lynn was actually instrumental in, in uh, reestablishing the contemporary art gallery in the museum to kind of give ownership to our native community where this is a space that they can design and call their own so that they can tell their story. It's not important for us to tell that story, but to just have that um, available to folks. So I'm really excited to see how that's evolving and certainly welcome any of you to come back if you need a refresher. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And the Contemporary Gallery actually um, it was Bill, Bill Gould and, and, and your brother, Chris, and was it Daryl? Daryl. Came Darryl. right after Nancy Joe and I started working there and said, hey, is there anywhere in the museum we can put out some contemporary artwork that's not really appropriate for powwows? So we're like, let's make a space. <laughs> I have another quick little thing. I think, I don't know if I've shared this with all of you before, but the house that Bill and I live in, we bought in 1982 was the Young family's home. So Ted Young was a, a I have a picture of him in front of the house as a baby here. And then um, 
I think it was when the horse farm was up for sale, either that or it was right before the woman, the horse farm lady bought it. Anyway, there was a point in time where Bill and I thought maybe we'd leave this isolated piece of Warner and go live in Warner, <laughs> be, be close to town. And we looked at that house to buy and Ted Young said, what are the ghouls just going to chase the youngs around and buy our old houses? <laughs> so that was Ted Young's house and, and we showed his picture earlier. So I, I love living in this small community where we all know each other and we love the museum. We're so glad we didn't buy it and it became <laughs> Mount Kearside Geneva Museum. <laughs> Certainly one of the treasures in town. Uh -huh. So other contemporary, ooh, we're not moving here. Maybe you want to talk about the commission for a minute and I'll try to get this uh, slide moving. Okay, so in 2010, probably in 2009, a representative Daniel Carr from Keene decided that he wanted to get the Abenaki recognized and he wanted to start a commission on native affairs in New Hampshire. And he approached the other Peter Newell, <laughs> the Penobscot man <laughs> who started, whose dad started the New Hampshire Intertribal Council and me and Paul Puglio and said that after talking around, we were the three people he wanted to work with. And, um, and so Peter Newell and I knew we had worked to get a meeting with Governor Lynch on um, starting a commission by Governor Pro Proclamation, which many of the other commissions had started that way. But Governor Lynch wanted us to get to go the legislative route. And Peter and I had decided we didn't want to do that. And so this was just two years after that. And we were just like, I don't know. And, and recognition of Abenaki tribes, it's not going to happen. So Daniel Carr was really adamant that we, he was going to do it with or without us. And so we finally said, well, I guess we better stay involved <laughs> if we want to see shape how it happens. So it was a pretty long um, yeah, it was a friend of mine at DCYF whose face I can see and name I'm not going to remember, but he had shared with me, and I guess this is some other famous saying, but I, Roger, Roger DeRoches, I always attribute it to Roger that making laws is like making sausage. <laughs> it's like a really ugly process you don't want to watch, but it's really great when it's done. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty grueling, but we stuck through it and uh, immediately the, all the language to recognize the tribes was removed from the bill, but the commission language stayed. And in the end, the commission on native house bill 1610 passed and, um, and it created the commission on native affairs, which still exists today. And which uh, Sherry was very instrumental in as, and as was Liz when she was here. So a big Warner connection with that. Yes, we both, uh, Liz served on the commission. I served on the, I was the first vice chair. That was horrible. I didn't want to, all the elders, all the work I did to engage the community. I told everybody, I, I don't want to ser serve on the commission because I really felt like I, it shouldn't be a self-serving thing. Peter would serve on the commission. All these other people would serve on the commission. I'd do the work, I'd be the organizer, but it wasn't for self-aggrandizement. I would not take a seat on the commission. And that very last day, there was one last fight and poor Daryl was the only person who could be at the state house, none of the rest of us. So Daryl's all by himself at the state house and Senator Martha from the seacoast, She's retired, lovely lady. Anyway, Martha says um, to settle this one last glitch that was going to hold the whole thing up. Okay, we're going to appoint a genealogist and it'll be the New Hampshire Society of Genealogists will appoint somebody to serve on the commission. And so Daryl was like, he goes, I kept thinking, what would Sherry say? What would Sherry say? And he agreed to it and they did it. And and then he told me, and I was just like, oh no. And so I worked so hard to find another genealogist, any other genealogist who could do it. Like, and nobody else, there's very few that, there's a certification in Native American genealogy, but that's all based on the Dawes rolls. It has nothing to do with trying to trace Abenaki roots. 
And so there are very few people that would be qualified to do that. And I wound up like calling all the elders and flogging myself. <laughs> I don't want to do this, but they all said, you need to do this. So we thankfully got that position taken off the commission, but that's how I came to be on the commission. Yep. <laughs> so mentioning Daryl brings up the Abenaki Trails Project. Yes. Daryl had a vision. <laughs> he did. Is it, has he been able to join us? Do we not? I don't think so. Okay. Well, I'll talk a little bit about it. And maybe Nancy Jo will talk a little bit about it too, because she's been another active participant. So Daryl decided in July that when we did the commission, that through that whole process, one of the frequent comments we heard legislators make was that New Hampshire was just a pass-through state. No Native Americans ever lived here. And uh, and it just really was so infuriating <laughs> the, that people actually believed that. And so it's never left us really. And Daryl said, I really wanna do this project. I wanna show that we've always been here and that we're still here. So we dreamed up this project, Abenaki Trails Project. And it was Hopkinton. We all agreed that Hopkinton made the most sense to start with. It was where Daryl lived. It was his project, his idea. The year before, Hopkinton had um, changed to uh, Indigenous Peoples Day from Columbus Day, and they had done a whole year of programming on Native American studies. And so that's where we started. And pretty quickly, we discovered uh, a village in the West Hopkinton area, um, a village site there. And, and then I was reading the Hopkinton history, a uh, Henniker history, and realized that all the artifacts in Henniker had been found in the eastern part of town. And I checked with Martha Taylor from the Henniker Historical Society and she said, yeah, that's true. And then we realized all those cornfields and agricultural places along the interval in East Henniker was also Abenaki village. Well, oh, it's all one village. <laughs> and they built the Everett Dam and cut it in half. But so that's when we realized, okay, our people didn't draw boxes on a map and, um, and stay in a town. So I think that's a little bit goes to what uh, Lynn was saying earlier, why we can't only talk about Warner if we're talking about indigenous people, even in a place like this. And we really are finding a lot of evidence that that here it was not nomadic at all. I would have still fought. I still believed what we hear all the time that summer on the coast, uh, spring and fall at the, at the garden grounds and winter at the hunting grounds. Well, when you think about it here, we have all three. Why would we wanna go truck over to the coast when we have all the fish we could eat right in the rivers and lakes right here? We can grow our corn here. And in fact, it's pretty clear that this is part of a, a growing zone for natives that we were trading with the Maine Indians and, and Northern New Hampshire, you know, more Northern people, our corn for other products they had to trade, trade us back. And then hunting, moose. I mean, right now, I just learned from the um, Krista Humboldt from the... Um, Nature Conservancy was just sharing with me that where I live, the, so the Mink Hills and um, crossing over into the area of Hanukkah, Bradford and to Hillsboro, it's all wild. We have just thousands of acres over here of wildland, that that is a wildlife, it's, it's currently designated as a wildlife des runway designated area. And so we would have no reason to go anywhere else to hunt either. It's just, I don't think our people moved around much. I mean, they may have left an area and moved to another area at some point because resources were getting a little depleted or something or whatever, but anyway. So that's kind of how we got going and it's been really incredible. So Nancy, did you want to share some of what your experience has been? Yeah, but I will ask you to talk about you know, the picture on the slide yeah. of the footprint. <laughs> okay. so. Um, one of the things, so we've all heard different places and, and for Daryl and I, who both grew up here and both knew we were native and other people knew we were native, 
what we didn't realize is that we had all these stories and most, we just assumed everybody knew everything we knew of these locations. And then as we started doing this, we learned, okay, some people know about this spot and some people know about this spot and some people know about this spot, but very few people know all these places that we know of. So <clears throat> this one was, and I actually had never been, to, several of them I had never been to, this was one of them. I thought um, I had been told about the steps near the Kentuckook River in Hanneker. I thought it was just rocks, a stairway going down into the, the river. And I wondered how they identified that as being Native American. And so when I was asking Martha about it, she said, oh, you mean the footprints in the rock? I go, oh, they're footprints in a rock? <laughs> so we all went out. And, um, and so all last year for Ju July, August, September, we had such a great fall, October into November, I think still, we were doing these excursions to these sites and we didn't make them really public events because we wanted to, Nancy was very, very much, uh, and Heather, make, wanting us to make sure that it was really safe to bring the public to and what were we gonna be encountering. So um, this summer there'll be the same excursions but the public will be invited. Uh, so anyway, we, we went, this was one of the sites we went to. And, um, and so when you, when you have a tribe and, we've lost so much of the culture and the knowledge and the information, but different people have pieces and pockets that have survived in the family. And so as the tribe has come back together in strength and 10 years ago, right after the commission got formed, four tribes in Vermont were, rec or four tribes were recognized by the state of Vermont as state recognized tribes. And uh, one of them is Nohegan and I had helped with their genealogies and saw that the Phillips, the Blakes and the Dyers, as I said before, were all a family band and uh, the Phillips are kind of the backbone of the Nelhegan tribe. So we are Nelhegan. Uh, but anyway, as, as that's been happening, more and more of the stories have been put back together. And so, you know, we're facing a pandemic right now so we all can probably understand better than most people would have ever understood before that the pandemics in the early 1600s when the, when the uh, Europeans first were coming to fish that raged through, wiped out 90% of, of our village. Imagine in this pandemic, if we lost 90% of the town of Warner, you would lose incredible, what if we lost Rebecca and, and, you know, and just didn't have that history bearer anymore? What if we lost the doctors and, and the medical people and, so anyway, that's what we had um, been through. And, and then this hiding in plain sight and so-called acculturating as if, you, as if you know, anybody who grew up here went to the South and decided they really liked black Baptist churches and worshiped there and lived in that community that you would be culturated and lose your white New England identity and become what a black southerner <laughs> so that whole acculturation thing is so silly but anyway here we are so <clears throat> um the story so we see these footsteps and we have brian shenevert who's our tribal historian and brian is the keeper of these stories for our tribe and he said oh the footprints in the rock yeah we know about those they are in several places there's some in maine there's some in vermont and there's a set out in Ohio we know about. And he said, for us, these are um, a meddling, a, a person with a lot of medicine is able to sink their feet in hard earth or stone. And so we were just like, wow. So who did we know from the records since contact, colonial times forward, who had really strong medicine that was an Abenaki person here. Oh, that would be Passaconaway with the incredible stories that he could turn dead leaves to life. So we really don't know whose footprints they are. It could have been any person with strong medicine from then back in time for 13,000 years, but that's what these footprints are. And so should we talk more about Abenaki trails or should we go on to talk more about footprints? We should hmm. probably um, talk a little bit about the footprints and then open it up to other other okay. stories, other folks. Okay. But that's what I like about Abenaki trails is taking things that some people know and maybe reinterpreting 
um, the way they've been interpreted before. Nance, did you wanna say anything before I go to the next slide? Well, just that um, as Sherry was saying, different families had different pieces of knowledge and those are starting to come together. You could say the same about the historical societies. Historical societies are kind of bound, tend to be bounded by our town borders. But it turned out what we've learned, one of the things we've learned that uh, several of the places where there's a lot of native settlement are right on, let's straddle those towns. So now, you know, taking stories from Hopkinton and Lynn find, realizes that that's a continuation of a story that's in Warner. So the pro, one of the aspects of this project is bringing people from these different towns, bringing people with different expertises um, uh, and people from the, from the Nolhegan band all looking at the same stuff at the same time through their own eyes and that's showing so much more information than we had known before. I mean, it's just, it's really opening uh, up the story quite a bit. And for me personally, it was Sherry and Daryl saying, you know, if you're gonna wanna understand native history, you gotta do that from the perspective of the river. So really a focus on um, traveling the river, um, the Kentuckic River, the, the Warner River, the Blackwater River, and looking at it from the perspective on the water and that looking to the land from that perspective. And it just looks completely different. And all of a sudden you see, oh, that's sort of the entrance right there. So that it's been just really uh, opening up the way of looking at native history. Um, using so many different eyes to see what we've, what we've had in our historical societies for all these years. So this is an example of something that was just discovered. And it's a very fun thing about this project. Just preparing for this talk, Rebecca came across a letter that had been published and this is one paragraph about it. And, and it talks about one of these footprints in Warner. So of course, Rebecca will find it if it's still there. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're constantly learning at, from each other and learning things that are in the historical record that we have as well. And I mapped, oh good, it worked. I mapped the locations of um, footprints and uh, the petroglyphs on Mount Kearsarge uh, this is the footprint in Warner and then the ones in Henniker. I hope you guys can see it because it's um, not visible for me at the bottom of the screen, but um, two locations that um, we've heard about in Hopkinton that have yet to be relocated and then the one that was the photo in Henniker. So, you know, we're, we will be mapping more of these sites. Um, and, uh, and all the different types of sites. And it's just pretty, the whole thing's pretty exciting. For the, all fact of us. That, the fact that we have, so there's a book called um, Petroglyphs in New, Ham, in New England, I think it's called. And uh, I got it at bookends many years ago. And I, I, so then I was looking through it as we started this project. And there were only two sites in all of New Hampshire, up around Franklin, and then the Henniker footprints in that book. So, and as I told you, what we knew when we first went to see the ones in Henniker, there's one or two in Maine, there's one in Vermont, and one in Ohio. So now all of a sudden, when Nancy Joe found two more in the Henna in the Hockington Historical Society contemporary writings about them. And then recently Rebecca finding the one in Warner, we've got rec records of four sets of footprints in this little tiny area. Think of what there is in New Hampshire that has just never been reported or studied or talked about. No wonder the legislators think it's a pass through state <laughs> because nobody has taken the time to do this. It's fun. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will um, look at the chat, see if we have some questions. 
Lynn, mute the person who's talking. <laughs> um, so Rebecca, you said something was on Skudak Road. Is that the footprint that you were referring to? Or the John? Oh, no, that was where the gypsies were staying when they came through Warner, Lower Warner mm -hmm. at Tuxberries. And I think it's Tuxberries lived on Skudak Road, which today is the Brofus House. And just before you get to the house, as you're coming from town, there's a flat section where there's a little field in front of Maureen Hamptons. And there's a road that went down to Bagley Bridge and there was a field there and it was called the board field is where they would stack the lumber to be picked up by the railroad or, or cattle or whatever was gonna be picked up. There was a spur there. So that would have been an area flat near the river where they could get water. And I, I think that's where they probably were camping. Cool, and the um, legislator that, that Sherry was talking about earlier with the um, commission was Martha Fuller Clark. Right. Rebecca. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sorry, we took so much time. We tried to compress all of this 13,000 years of history into a short amount of time, but it's very hard. But you know, if you have any stories, we would love to hear them because as you see, we're always discovering new things and incorporating it into our history. Mike wants to know if the footprints are lady size seven. <laughs> oh, Mike knows he likes to call, call it my Cinderella story. I did <laughs> take my shoes off and step into them and they are a perfect fit. <laughs> There you go. So did, um, if you have a story you'd like to share, just unmute yourself and, and speak up. We talked about lots and lots of different things. <laughs> if you have any other questions for us, we'd be happy to, to answer. We, I'm sure we didn't cover everything. Patricia Bass has a question, Lynn. Okay, hi, Patricia. Hi. Um, I, I wondered if Sherry could talk uh, um, a little bit more about the Abenaki people receiving a recognition from the state of New Hampshire. I gather you're not uh, keen on doing that and I wonder why or you have some recognition, but you, uh, you're you not keen on getting any further recognition, right? Well, thank you for asking, Patricia. It's, uh, it's not that we're not um, keen on getting recognition in New Hampshire. We are very much so. It's, um, it's just, it's a really, really, really hard road to hoe. And if you look at the issue of recognition there's federal recognition and then there's state recognition. Those are two different categories. Uh, both path, so it, for federal recognition, the path is just really, really hard. It takes years and years and tons of money and research to put something together. And what the burden of proof is that there is a continual record of government to government relationship. So um, Vermont, uh, okay, I have to say that the other part of, of Lynn's earlier statements about talking about more than just Warner and when you talk about the Abenaki, for us, our homeland is in Dakina. And prior to colonists arriving, Abenaki people lived all over. So our language connects us to native family groups or tribes, as people call them today, in Southern Quebec, Western Maine, down along the Maine, New Hampshire border, all of New Hampshire, all of Vermont, except the tiny Southwestern corner of Vermont and Northern Maine, uh, Massachusetts, about to root to. That is the area that people who shared a language encompassed and we call it Indakina, our homeland. So when the 
colonists came, not only did they draw little boxes to make towns, they also drew states and they drew federal boundaries. So our homeland has been divided into states and countries and nations. So we talk about Vermont and New Hampshire. For us as people, the Connecticut River is a highway. It is not a political boundary. And we are all Abenaki and we live within our homeland. And our people may have settled in different parts of that homeland than where a tribal group maintained a nation to nation relationship with a government over time to, in order to prove this existence that's been continual that allows a recognition status to happen. So in Vermont, there were four different family bands out of many family bands that were able to work through a process with the government, state government in Vermont that allowed a path to state recognition. And that those four tribes were indeed recognized in 2012, I believe. In New Hampshire, and Senator David Waters and I have talked about this, many of us have talked about this. Um, I know of two possible family bands that might be able to show a continuous path that might lead to rec state recognition if we were to develop a path for recognition. One of them, I don't, there's very few descendants living now. The other one, the descendants haven't really shown an interest in becoming a formal tribe and going for state recognition. So at this point in time, I don't know of much conversation with the state and the state of New Hampshire government. You know, people, Abenaki people try to equate New Hampshire state government and Vermont state government. Bill said to them, you're trying to compare Russia and Sweden. I said, okay, I could see Vermont being compared to Sweden. I don't really like being <laughs> New Hampshire being compared to Russia, but yeah, kinda. <laughs> so you have a very different political environment in New Hampshire. When we went to get the commission um, in place, unbeknownst to us, the Democrats that year were going for a casino. So right away, the Republicans were furious that the Democrats were using us as a pawn to get their casino. And we're just like, hello, we're not a pawn for anybody. Over my dead body, will there be a casino in New Hampshire in my name? So whatever politics you Republicans and Democrats have, leave us out of it. We want a freaking commission. We don't want a casino. So we got past that and we convinced them of that. But, but it's a tough state. You know, this is the state that 20 years after everybody else acknowledged uh, Martin Luther King Day, right? And so to try to freaking educate, I mean, Abenaki Trails is starting to educate, like, hello, we were here. But to go from there to a path to state recognition is a lot of work. And there aren't a lot of us. It's, it's a lot of hard work. So at this point, we, we are very thankful that we have the rights and privileges that a state recognition affords us through the four tribes that are state recognized. You'll hear people say, those are Vermont tribes. This New Hampshire doesn't recognize. I said, what the state of Vermont recognized became a state recognized tribe. And the state of New Hampshire cannot unrecognize what has been recognized. And so the same rights and privileges that uh, are afforded to state recognized tribes are afforded to us. No, even though we live in New Hampshire, even though we live on the east side of our highway instead of the west side of our highway. So would I support a recognition process and path in New Hampshire for other family bands? You betcha, I'd fight for them all day long. Do I see that happening and do other um, people like Senator Waters who have such a heart to make this happen and, and Rebecca can tell you and Lynn and, um, and other people how hard he's worked for the, the Black History Trails project. Like he would be a champion for that. He has studied it. We just aren't seeing the material to even make that kind of a monumental fight fruitful in the end at this point. 
And who knows, maybe if we can get enough people going with Abenaki trails and get beyond these four towns, maybe we'll find enough evidence <laughs> and, and be able to see that happen. But I don't see it in the near future. And in the meantime, I'm tribal genealogist for our tribe. More and more of the unaffiliated Abenaki who live in the eastern part of Indakina are finding that their families are tied to one of those four state recognized tribes and are, are becoming enrolled in the recognized tribes. So thankfully we at least have that path. Sherry, Catherine O'Brien, who you probably know, who is uh, joining us from way down south tonight in a thunderstorm, um, would, was wondering if you could describe how your apprenticeship with Native American master artists work. And she's wondering if a Native American uh, master artist would teach a non-Native person their art. So um, through the New Hampshire Council on the Arts, we are um, able to take on apprentices and have some funding, which helps pay for supplies and, and travel and some time um, on the teacher's part. And, um, and, that, and we've been so thankful for that. It's been wonderful. The answer to the question about whether or not Native people will teach non-Native people is mixed. The, you know, it depends on the art and it depends on any conditions that were given at the time of teaching. So Jeannie Brink, who I, um, I learned fancy basket making from, she learned it from Sophie Nolet, Wawanolet. Sophie, this, the, the Nolets and the Wawanolets are the same family at Odenac and there's two sisters no, let. Sophie Nolet was the basket maker from Odenac that taught Jeannie. And she taught, Jeannie's family had come from Odenac to Vermont. Sophie taught Jeannie with the understanding that Jeannie would only ever teach fancy Abenaki basket making to other Abenaki. And so Jeannie asks the same of all her apprentices. So I cannot uh, teach fancy Abenaki basket making to non Abenaki people. Newt Washburn, the Sweetser family, his tradition had always been against teaching anyone outside the family, their form of basket making, but Newt got to the point where it was gonna die. Nobody in the family was doing it and he made that bold step. And he never asked us to not teach other people from outside his family or our families or Abenaki. So Bill and I um, do teach non-natives the, um, that other, you know, the utilitarian style basket making or the Sweetser style basket making. And then in terms of other like bead makers and stuff, I don't know for sure. I don't, I mean, I haven't heard of restrictions, but I think it really depends. I think there are some things that are very sacred. There's some, um, you know, for the tribes that have lost so much that when there's something that we have that's ours, it's hard for people to let go of that. And so this is a conversation that goes on all the time between native people regarding how much we give up and how much we hold on to. We um, are fortunate, the two of us, to know um, people who teach language. Um, and I, of course, I'm a non-Abenaki person. And um, when Liz, wanted to do uh, Abenaki language classes at, at the museum, we were called before an elder and he, he talked to us about why we wanted to do it and who was gonna be involved. And we didn't make a big hairy deal out of it, uh, you know, but there was a, a small group of us who would meet regularly and study language. And so, so this is Ely Joubert and, and Jesse Bruchak. And I think Ely just wanted to hear the language being spoken again. You know, he'd say, go, go talk to people at the grocery store in Abenaki. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Jesse teaches the language. You can get on, you can, any of you can sign up. In fact, Dave White from um, the Abenaki Trails Project, one of our, our community partners, took a one month class with me. Both he and I got, have gotten busy and haven't gotten back to it. I'm hoping to. The new class starts Monday night, the first Monday in April. So each month it's a new class and this is a beginner's class. So 
feel free to um, hit me up and, <laughs> and I'll give you the connection. And we do it all online and it's every Monday night. Um, and you too can, uh, Kwai Kwai, Ndelawazi, speaking in Abenaki. <laughs> Gotta go back to gallery view, see if there's, is there anyone else who has a question or would like to share a story? Um, yes, Lynn, this is Nancy Martin. Um, I wonder if there's anyone who can speak to the early colonial times when Dartmouth College was recruiting Native Americans as students at the <coughs> college to, um, to um, attempt to convert them uh, to Christianity and then send them back to their native communities so that they could spread the word. Does anyone know more about that? Um, it's not something that I know many more, more details about than, than what you just said, um, other than um, they could not sustain themselves as, as a college just for native people and then open it up to others. So they started in Connecticut and uh, somebody Oakham <laughs> was the- Samson, Samson Oakham. Thank you, was um, one of the first students and he came to New Hampshire with them when they relocated. One thing I've learned because of Abenaki Trails that I never knew, there was a big competition about which town was gonna get Dartmouth and Hanneker was in the vie for that. And they did a big project on that. And they have College Road today, which they think might have been named <laughs> because of their hopes to land Dartmouth, which they obviously did not. But at any rate, um, so then they started to take in some Abenakis, but the Abenaki students just hated it there. They would come down, they would walk back and forth from Odenak to Dartmouth, and they would spend some time there. They, our people were very, very um, educated and smart, really. For Abenaki people, they spoke English, French, Abenaki, and then the dialects of the other Algonquian language people around. But also, when the Catholics started to proselytize them, and, and masses were all in Latin, and French people didn't care and didn't know Latin. Abenaki people said, we're not going to uh, sit through this until we understand what you're saying. And they learned Latin. So Abenaki people were just very educated, very intelligent, um, quite the contrary of the picture we're given <laughs> of dupes between the French and used as pawn pieces between the French and the English. But at any rate, uh, they really disliked um, just the environment of sitting in the classroom. It just, our whole educational ways are so different. For one thing, English is a noun-based language. Abenaki is a verb-based language. So in our, in our style, it's all about doing. I'm an experiential learner and I've learned that terminology now, but as a kid in school, oh my God. And then I'd be punished for being so social and active and doing things. I'd be in the corner by myself with the boards around me. <laughs> but, um, but it was, see, it was because I was Abenaki. So anyway, there were several students that were Abenaki, but it didn't really work out for them. They didn't like it very much. And then as um, Lynn said, I think it was by and large um, monetary, but also because they were just you know, so did, um, what's his name that started Dartmouth? Did he see these students as bright? No, he saw them as failures. They can't sit in a class and, and do these things. And that's been an issue going through. If you read the Navajo woman, I'm so terrible with names. I can see faces. She wrote a book called Silver Bear, was it? No, but something like that. Anyway, there was a woman from uh, the Navajo Nation who recently was a student at Dartmouth and then a professor at Dartmouth. And um, her name is, like all names is escaping me, but she talked about in her book as a student, like just eye contact for a lot of the tribes out West, making eye contact is uh, something disrespectful. And also in her culture, women did not ever speak out and argue. And so she was punished in, in Dartmouth for not being, um, you know, putting herself forward and for not being able to make eye contact. So 
it's a college that hasn't ever really or has struggled all these years to understand native people. But I learned my fractions as a child with my parents trying to figure out our blood quantum so that we'd know whether we could go to Dartmouth for free or not, which of course, no matter what blood quantum they had come up with, we wouldn't have gotten to Dartmouth free. It's never been free. Um, was Peter Paul was Oakland? Did he go to Dartmouth? I mean, there's stories about him as I a student. So. I do believe, yeah, he was one of them. Yep. So, you know, of course, the story is like he wasn't a good student and he'd run away out of the classroom. And here's this man who wrote a language course yep. for Abenaki people that right. is wonderful. You know, in, in like the 1820s, he wrote this. Yep. Um, and let's see, Lynn Clues mentioned um, the, the uh, Dartmouth professor who's Navajo, her last name is Alvord. Yes. Oh, and I almost had the first name too. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> I have her book in the other room. <laughs> okay. Kath Kathleen Rooney. Um, I just, I'm going to say bye-bye, but I just want to tell you that this has been so, so beneficial for my understanding. I've just finished reading Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a really wonderful kind of foundation for the, your presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Kathleen. Are you aware that uh, the Bradford... Another thing that has sprung up from the community of, through the Abenaki Trails Project is that the Bradford Library, Lori Buka has come up with um, reading Braiding Sweetgrass the month of April. And at the end of April on the 29th, we're having a discussion online about the book. So I hope huh? you'll join us for that. If you, if you zing me, let me know. Thank you so much. And there's also a book just out by um, uh, Claudia Chickless, who is a, a, a descendant of the um, Masatakwis family, who you saw the picture of earlier. It was uh, edited by her daughter, Joyce Haywood. And we will be getting copies at the historical societies in Warner and Hopkinson and Main Street Bookends. <laughs> We'll be getting copies of that as well. And that story's all about that family. There you go. Woven through the sweet grass. Fabulous. Nice. It's fabulous. <laughs> when I, when I this is a lesson. When I told people I was reading this book, they immediately said, oh, South Carolina. I said, no. <laughs> but that was, I mean, that is, that's, I would have said the same thing. So thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you for joining bye bye. us. And by the way, the sweetgrass in South Carolina, I love their baskets. I got to sit with one of the basket makers one time and we had a wonderful discussion back and forth, whole different kind of grass. They're both called sweetgrass, but very different species of grass. Okay, and anyone else? Well, then I'll say thank you very much um, for joining us. And I will say, Uli Nana Walma Zi, Nahomio Zi Mina, which is very poorly pronounced. <laughs> um, I hope you're well till I see you again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uli Oni.